another anecdote. About 10 years ago, I was stuck in a taxi in London and the taxi, I had my bishop shirt on and the taxi driver looked back at me to apologize that the traffic was so appalling. Seeing me to be a bishop, he asked about one or two matters concerning the Church of England, as one might, and we talked about this and that. And then he said, most emphatically, he said, what I always say is, if God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, then everything else is basically rock and roll in it. And I said, wow. All four Gospels and Acts, Paul and the rest speak of Jesus winning the victory over death and hence over sin and hence over all the powers of the world that have shaken their puny little fists at God the Creator whose power is the power of love. Welcome to another episode of Ring Them Bells where we exist to help you rediscover the Bible on its own terms. We found that the supernatural focus of the Bible has been suppressed and we are bringing that back into the light. We're doing that with interviews and content from great scholars like Tim Mackey of The Bible Project and featured here today, N.T. Wright. Take a moment to subscribe so that you're aware of all the alerts that'll be coming up and other great content that we have coming your way. Let's get started. There once was a lawyer called Mark who had a fine house in a park. Then he added some books and a chapel that looks like something that came from the ark. <laughs> who, who needs a chatbot? <laughs> Thank you for your welcome and your kind words. Um, I'm sorry you didn't have a guitar because that Dylan song should have been sung, but we'll get to that perhaps. It's very good to be back here again and to have a chance to share some reflections on the way in which John's Gospel presents the mission of God. Now, as many of you know, I've spent much of my life researching St. Paul and also the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I have uh, managed to avoid writing anything major on John, but John's Gospel has always been right next door, as it were, to where I live. And the older I get, the more fascinated I am by it. In particular, I've been struck by John as I've been working on a sequel to my book, Surprised by Hope. In that book, I argued that the Christian hope from the Bible onwards is not despite what most people think, for our souls to go to heaven, but for God's new creation, his new heavens and new earth, and for the resurrected bodies which we'll be given to take up new purposeful vocations within the new creation. And I've now been developing this in terms of what I've called God's homecoming, arguing that the whole Bible, Old and New Testaments, tells the story not of how we can get up to God, but of how God has come to dwell with us, or God wants to come and has done and will do to dwell with us. After all, the strap line at the end of the book of Revelation isn't the dwelling of humans is now with God, it's the dwelling of God is now with humans. My hunch is that from some time in the third and fourth centuries, many teachers in the church were borrowing ideas from Plato and the Neoplatonists and that though they often grasped the heart of the faith, they were really in love with Jesus and seeking to serve him. And they often lived their faith sacrificially and wisely, but they were often seduced into the going to heaven narrative and away from the biblical promises that God the creator would come in person to his world, to fill it with his knowledge and his glory as the waters cover the sea, as Isaiah and Habakkuk say. So where does John's Gospel sit within this kind of discussion? For many of the early fathers, John was designated as the spiritual gospel, over against the other three, which appeared to say more about Jesus' human life. And that indeed has been the fashion until very recently. Many of us in college or seminary were taught as a fixed point that Matthew, Mark, and Luke gave us the human Jesus and that John gave us the divine Jesus. And this was then often correlated with the idea that perhaps John was written later 
after the church had begun to develop the idea that the human being Jesus was actually more than merely human. And entire theories about gospel origins have been built on this foundation, which now it seems is made of loose sand. Nearly 10 years ago, Richard Hayes, who many of you will know, published his groundbreaking book, Echoes of Scripture in the Gospels, in which he argued that all four canonical Gospels, not just John, present Jesus as the embodiment, the incarnation of Israel's God. They have a strong theology of that, all the stronger for being implicit because it's woven into the very fabric of how they tell the story and in particular how they deploy quotations, allusions and echoes of Israel's scriptures. But if Richard Hayes's arguments have demonstrated, which I think isn't too strong a word, that the other three Gospels also have a strong theology of incarnation, of Jesus as the embodiment of Israel's God, we should consider as well the ways in which John's Gospel has what we might call a strong this-worldly theology in relation both to Jesus himself as a fully human being and to the disciples in their calling. John's Jesus is a genuine, full-on human being. He's not just play-acting. And that's part of the point. And the danger in seeing John as the spiritual gospel is that we imagine it has nothing really much to do with the present world except for handing on the message that we need to escape the present world. Actually, this is really a matter of getting our theological metaphysics sorted out. Because for several generations, the Western world, you and me and the world in which we've grown, grown up, has drifted in the direction of deism or Epicureanism with a God who is either distant from the world or in another sphere altogether. And what we call secularism has deep roots in much older philosophies which made it difficult to think of God and the world together, of God acting or being present within the world. Many discussions of early Christology have assumed that split-level view of reality, so that a division has appeared between those who clearly say that Jesus was and is divine and those who seem, from our point of view, to be less clear or even to be ignoring such a claim. So, the scholarship that was current when I was first studying 50 years ago put John's Gospel firmly on the side of what was in effect a docetic Christology, with Jesus being divine and only seeming to be human. And all this went with a view of salvation, and hence a view of the church's mission, that was all about the rescue of humans from this world, so that they could go somewhere else, presumably heaven. Not that John ever says that. John 18.36 was quoted endlessly, in versions like that of the King James, where Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. There we are, we are told, John is envisaging an otherworldly kingdom, which has nothing to do with the present creation. It's all about escaping. Actually, even the King James Version gives a strong clue right away as to a better way of reading that passage. Because at the end of that same verse, the King James has Jesus saying, but now my kingdom is not from hence. That gives you the clue. It would have been better to translate the earlier line, my kingdom is not from this world. The Greek is ek to cosmu tutu, out of this world. And the ek indicates not the character or location of the kingdom, but its point of origin, where it comes from. Cutting a long story short, the point is that the kingdom does not originate within this world. As Jesus says, if it did come from this world, if, if it was characterized by this world, then his followers would have been fighting to stop him being arrested. But throughout the gospel, and particularly its missionary theology, which is my theme today, the kingdom is emphatically for this world. And at this point, John is exactly in line with Mark chapter 10, where Jesus contrasts the regular violent and exploitative behavior of the rulers of this age 
with the modus operandi of the kingdom he is launching, which is all about if you want to be a leader, you've got to be last. If you want to be first, you've got to be the slave of all because the Son of Man didn't come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This, we might reflect, is a lesson that the church often forgets, to put it mildly. But I'm slightly allowing the argument to run ahead of itself in order to understand the underlying logic of the missionary mandate in John 20 and 21, which we will work our way through to, we have to go right back to the beginning, to the start of the gospel. But if you get the start of John's gospel, you get built in the start of everything, because John begins in the beginning, en arche. And I've often said to students that anyone in that world, first century Jewish world, starting a book in the beginning, within the traditions of Israel, that's like a musical composer at any time from the early 19th century onwards, starting a symphony by da-da-da-dum. A sort of sense, we've been here before. We know this one. Or maybe like a playwright today, having a character stride forward and start a soliloquy, to be or not to be? That is the question. Again, is this a pastiche? What is it? In the beginning is about as clear an echo as you could want. And it's not just a convenient literary allusion. It's a statement of intent. The whole book is about creation, about the creator God, about God's intention for the world and his accomplishment of new creation. Now, the new creation obviously comes out clearest in chapters 20 and 21 with Jesus' resurrection. But before we get there, we have to notice how the famous prologue, John 1, 1 to 18, actually works. The theme is, of course, the word, the logos. I have long been convinced that the primary reference here is the creative word in Genesis and the Psalms, and particularly Isaiah 40 and 55. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. As the rain and the snow come down and water the earth and make it fruitful, so will my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It will accomplish what I purpose and prosper in the thing for which I send it. God's word will accomplish new creation. That's the message of Isaiah. Yeah, now, of course, Logos, no doubt a philosophically minded reader of John, would hear echoes of the Stoic idea of the Logos, the inner rationality of all things. But if John intends a reference in that direction as well, he is containing it within the strongly biblical theme of creation, which is radically different from Stoic pantheism. So, having begun with that clear allusion to Genesis 1, John's prologue builds up to the climax in verse 14, where the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's one of the most striking, seminal, vital, and indeed missional verses in all scripture. Of course, many of us, when we hear that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, we think of the incarnation, quite rightly. And many of us instinctively think of Christmas, because in my tradition and many others, John 1, 1 to 14 is regularly read at Christmas carol services. But we ought to think as well of the image of God. The word image doesn't occur in the Johannine prologue, but in Genesis 1, the climax of that great first creation story is the creation of human beings in the image of God. And John 1, deliberately parallel to this, builds up to the word becoming flesh. The former explains the latter. In the theological systems of my student days, theologians used to shake their heads and say that incarnation was a category mistake. Uh, God into man won't go, I remember one lecture say, lecturer saying, as though this was obvious and we all knew it. But the answer to that always was the doctrine of the image. God made humans in his own image, so that, if I can put it like this, for God to become anything, a human is what he ought to become, rather than, say, a hawk or a hedgehog. But the idea of the image itself means what it means within the larger reality 
which is there in Genesis and which John picks up and makes a major theme of his whole book. Creation in Genesis 1 is designed as a temple. I was delighted yesterday here at the end of the conference which has just finished to run into John Walton, who's taught many of us how to read Genesis 1 and other passages as well. Creation is a temple. It's a heaven plus earth structure with an image at its heart. Anyone in the ancient world would know that. Genesis 1 falls out like the construction of a typical temple in its six stages. And the image which would be at the heart of an ancient temple would convey the presence and power of the deity and also convey the worship of the people back to that God. This, by the way, is the outflanking answer to the endless and fruitless arguments about the six days in Genesis 1. It's nothing to do with chronology and everything to do with ancient temple building. So is John suggesting that with Jesus we have a new equivalent for the temple with Jesus at its heart? Yes, that's exactly what he is suggesting. At the end of the first chapter, Jesus likens himself to Jacob's ladder, which is one of the many temple-like symbols in Genesis, joining heaven and earth. In chapter 2, Jesus performs his dramatic act of judgment in the temple, and he speaks about its destruction and rebuilding, and John explains he was talking about the temple of his body, and so on. There are further hints and suggestions in typically oblique Johannine style, all the way to the resurrection story itself, where Mary Magdalene, looking into the empty tomb through her tears, sees two angels, one at either end of the slab of stone where Jesus' body had been. Any first century Jew might well realize this is like, maybe meant to represent, the kaporeth, the mercy seat at the heart of the temple with the cherubim at either end. The crucified Jesus has become the place where and the means by which God meets with his people and meets with them in grace. So John 1 does indeed echo Genesis 1 with the word becoming flesh echoing the creation of humans in God's image. But in Genesis, the build-up to the creation and vocation of humans is, as you know, the creation of sea and land, of plants and animals. For John, the build-up is the story of Israel summed up in the work of John the Baptist, the last and greatest prophet who witnesses to the light, though not himself being the light. Similarly, in verse 17, John writes that while the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus the Messiah. Is that a contrast or a consequence? John leaves that question hanging in the air. So when John writes in verse 14 that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, the word for dwelt, as many of you will know, is eskenosen, incorporating the noun skene, which means tent or tabernacle. It's actually very difficult to translate this into fluent English, which picks up that overtone. The word became flesh and pitched his tent among us, like God coming to live in the tabernacle in the wilderness. The incarnation is the new tabernacle, the new temple. That's the origin of the missionary movement in John's Gospel. You may perhaps know I've recently published a children's Bible, rather to my own surprise, but the publishers insisted I have a go. Actually, not an easy thing to do. I was told I could have 150 stories and they had to be a maximum of 150 words each. Oh my goodness, I sat down with a large sheet of paper and realized I'm going to need at least 35 or 40 of those stories to be about Jesus. So I've only just got over 100 to do the whole of the rest. And all sorts of, you know, I needed to have Paul in there. Fancy a Bible written by N.T. Wright without Paul. That would just be extraordinary. But in particular, I was determined to bring out, and I think we did, that sequence from Genesis through the tabernacle, through the temple in Jerusalem, and then to the word becoming flesh and dwelling in our midst, and then to the new heavens and new earth. 
I'm glad to say that these scenes and the others which connect with them really do come out in what the publishers have called rather oddly God's Big Picture Story Bible. Didn't know that God needed a Bible, but anyway, he's now got one. So John now says the word became flesh and tabernacled among us and we gazed on his glory, glory as of the father's only son, full of grace and truth. This is the mission of God. This is where the story was going all along. The tabernacle and the temple were forward pointers with the promise of new creation, a new creation in which God the creator would come and dwell among us. Thus, the mission of God in the Gospel of John is rooted in the mission of the Son into the world. The Word became flesh could serve as the key not only for Christology, but also for the whole of what we could call God's project in and for the world. The temple theology in which heaven and earth come together comes into focus with the human being, the image at the heart of the temple. Now, there was, of course, no image in the Jerusalem temple because only a living human being would do to reflect the living God. But now here he is, the living God, present in and as the living human being. When John says, we gazed upon his glory, that is part of what he means. You have to think of the glory in the tabernacle, the glory in the temple, the glory that Isaiah saw in chapter 6. And now we gazed upon his glory. Now, of course, much of John's gospel is about that glory as it is revealed in the public career of Jesus, the signs that he performs and the teaching he gives. But with the resurrection, a whole new world is born. John's account of this in chapters 20 and 21 opens up the mission of God in the form of the promised Holy Spirit, breathed by Jesus into his followers to energize them for the work ahead. And this leads me into the next main section of this lecture, new creation, new temple, new image bearers. John has prepared the way for chapters 20 and 21 with brief, dense promises lodged earlier in the gospel. In chapter 7, we find ourselves at the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, in Jesus' day, this involved the powerful symbolism of the pouring out of water to remind the Judeans of Moses striking the rock to give the Israelites a drink. Jesus takes over that symbolism by echoing Isaiah 55, guess what, again, and saying, anyone who's thirsty, come to me and drink adding that, according to Scripture, the one who believes in him will have rivers of living water flowing out of his heart. The Scripture Jesus has in mind, it's widely agreed, is that dreamlike sequence in Ezekiel 47, when the temple has been rebuilt and filled with the divine glory, and now the river flows out from the temple all the way down to make even the Dead Sea fresh. And behind that again, there stands the image of the four rivers of Eden in Genesis 2, the four rivers that flow out of the garden. And our minds then jump forward as well, if we know what we're about, to the picture in the New Jerusalem in Revelation 21 and 22, where the river of the water of life flows out of the new heaven plus earth city. But the point of, for John in chapter 20 is that with Jesus' death and resurrection, the new temple has been built at last, with, as we saw, Jesus himself as the mercy seat, the place where God meets with his people in grace. Now, in chapter 7, John explains that the image of flowing water was a reference to the Spirit, which those who believed in Jesus would receive. And he adds the striking sentence, the Spirit was not yet, it's an odd sentence in Greek, upo garein pneuma, for there was not yet Spirit, because Jesus was not yet glorified. What does that typically cryptic sentence mean? If the disciples are to receive the Spirit themselves and to become conduits through whom the Spirit can flow out to others, they must be cleansed. 
like the tabernacle and the temple. They must be purified for the living God to dwell with them, within them, and work through them. So when Jesus breathes his spirit onto the disciples in chapter 20, verses 19 to 23, this must mean that the work of Calvary and Easter has had this effect. Jesus' death has opened up this new possibility for his followers to become spirit bearers. It is the mission of God. The other passage which points in the same direction ahead of the final events themselves is in John chapter 12 in verses 20 to 32. We're back in Jerusalem this time for Passover and some Greeks who have come to the feast want to see Jesus. You might expect that Jesus would say, okay, I'll see you next Tuesday for lunch. That'll be fun, whatever it might be. Instead of meeting them, Jesus explains that he sees their request to meet him as a sign that the time has come for the great turnaround in cosmic history. At the moment, the Greeks, like the rest of humankind, are enslaved to the dark lord, the ruler of this world. But Jesus sees their request as the sign that, as he says, now the judgment of this world is coming. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. In other words, God's mission to the world is waiting for the victory that Jesus will win through his death on the cross. When he is lifted up, glorified in that double entendre sense, because on the cross he displays to the full the self-giving love of God, which is the heart of glory for John at least. But once that has been done, the mission can and will proceed. The mission to tell humans everywhere that the slave master has been overthrown and that they are now invited into the free love of the Creator God. Jesus' forthcoming death will prove to be the victory that opens the doorway to the worldwide mission. The more I've thought about this, the more I realize that a lot of stuff that I heard and read when I was younger just misses the point entirely, as though the early Christians had had this new experience and they wanted to share it with people, so they went around the world and said, you could have this experience too. Well, that's no doubt one dimension of it. But the point is that with Jesus' death and resurrection, something has happened as a result of which the world is a different place. And one of the major differences is that now the pagan nations who had been under the rule of the Lord of this world, are under that rule no longer, and they can now hear and receive the gospel. So these two passages in chapters 7 and 12 prepare the way for the remarkable teaching in the farewell discourses of chapters 13 to 17. Many have pointed out here that Jesus is drawing his disciples into his own mission, constituting them as the new temple in which, by the Spirit, the Father and the Son together will come and dwell in them and with them. John 13 to 17 presents a kaleidoscopic picture of these themes, reflecting the multiple interlocking meanings of the divine life itself. But at its heart in chapter 15, the passage about the vine, it is all about the commissioning of the disciples to be branches in the vine which is Jesus. The vine is a symbol for Israel and the temple, and in that capacity they will be part of the new temple movement to bear fruit that will last. This is how the work of Jesus will spread into the wider world. This is the mission of God, not simply a mission which God commands and directs, as though from a distance, but a mission in which God is personally present and active by the Spirit. The disciples are thus constituted as the new temple where God himself will live in person. I in them and thou in me, that the world may believe. With the gift of the Spirit, the Word becomes flesh and dwells within us, so that the world may gaze upon his glory. 
Now, that gives us, gives us, of course, what we today might call a very high ecclesiology. And I suspect that many of us who grew up in some variety of Protestant tradition have been inoculated against any such idea of making a grandiose picture of the church. We're all too aware of the danger of arrogance in the church. If the church for one moment forgets that its role, its mission, its very identity is entirely dependent on God's grace and the gospel. But actually, in my experience, that temptation is present in all churches and Christian leaders, whatever their official theology, whether they actually hold a high ecclesiology or not. Always easy for Christian leaders to get ideas above themselves. Trust me, I'm a bishop, I know. Um, Anyway, all this prepares us for the truly extraordinary scene in chapter 20, focused on verses 19 to 23. The doors are locked because the disciples are afraid of the Judean authorities who might well be coming to arrest them after having, so they thought, already dealt with Jesus. But there are no locked doors in the kingdom of God. Jesus comes and stands in the midst. And we hear John whispering, yes, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. But now the word has become flesh in a whole new way. The disciples gain in, gaze in astonishment at the signs of his glory, the wounds in his hands, which uh, uh, tell them of the love which went to die for them. Peace be with you, he says. The peace he had promised in the upper room, the peace he has now won on the cross. Then the disciples, says John, were glad when they saw the Lord. Well, yes, of course. But now comes the true launch of the mission of God through the Spirit. Verse 21 of chapter 20, one of the most important in all missiology. Peace be with you, says Jesus again, and then, as the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Now the word becomes flesh and dwells in the wider world through Jesus' followers so that the world may gaze upon God's glory. That is the clear implication of the as so in verse 21. Everything we learn about Jesus revealing his glory, the Father's glory, in the first 12 chapters of the Gospel is now to be translated into the spirit-given movement of the church, the mission of God in the wider world. Jesus had said in the upper room, by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. The farewell discourses are bookended that way. At the start of chapter 13, John says that Jesus, having loved his own who were in the world, loved them east telos to the uttermost. And now at the end of chapter 17, Jesus concludes his so-called high priestly prayer with the petition that the love with which the Father has loved Jesus maybe in them, in the disciples, and I in them, he says. In other words, the as so of verse 21 doesn't mean mere imitation, watching Jesus and copying him, though that's a good way to go. What matters is that this is the further embodiment of the Son. It is the word becoming flesh once more. Now, all this, of course, takes place under the overarching rubric of new creation. John 20 is designed to bring this out with many echoes of Genesis 1 and 2, to which John, as I say, had gestured at the start of his gospel. John emphasizes right at the start of the chapter 20, and then again in verse 19, that this is the first day of the week. I was saying in the lecture I gave yesterday, two days before, on the Friday, the sixth day of the week, the day when humans were created, Pontius Pilate brought Jesus out to the crowd and said, here is the man. Of course, John means this is the genuine article at last. Here is the real human. He is the only truly human one, the one who truly reflects the creator God, who truly reflects his image into the world. But on that day, that evening, Jesus finishes the work he'd been given to do. The word is tetelestai, it's finished, echoing the end of the first creation story at the beginning of Genesis 2. Then on the seventh day, the Saturday, 
God incarnate rests in the tomb, the work having been done. But now the new week begins, the eighth day, you might say. In other words, the launch of new creation itself starts in the dark, but the light soon dawns. Mary and Peter and John run to and fro. Mary supposes that Jesus was the gardener, which was the right mistake, of course, since it is through him that new creation is now going to blossom and be fruitful. And all this brings us back to verses 19 to 23. Again, John emphasizes it's the first day of the week. When John says something twice like that, you better take him seriously. As in Genesis 2, which is where God breathed into human nostrils the breath of life in the first place, so now Jesus breathes his new life into his followers. And if we have John 7 still in our minds, and John just gives you these hints, like some of the great novelists just dropping something in, but you're supposed to remember it because it'll all join up in the end. With John 7 in mind, we should realize that this breathing of the Spirit and this commissioning is all about the rivers of living water. The disciples are to be those through whom Jesus' own life is poured out into the world. As the Father sent me, so I send you. There is a further word at verse 23, and it often appears puzzling. Having breathed his Spirit into his followers, Jesus declares, if you forgive anyone's sins, they're forgiven. If you retain anyone's sins, they're retained. We might more naturally be inclined to emphasize the first, the gospel is surely all about forgiveness, and ignore the second. But both matter, and they matter because in the new creation, God has promised to put everything right, as in the Psalms or Isaiah. And where people persist in worshipping idols and living by arrogance, violence, greed and lust, this must be denounced and dealt with. I actually see this word as directly dependent on what Jesus had said in John 16, which is another missional passage. When the Spirit comes, the Spirit will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. That's another dense and difficult passage, but at its heart it must mean that the Spirit, active in the Church's proclamation, must speak truth to power, must do boldly what both John the Baptist and Jesus did, denouncing the arrogant false claims to power and authority, and modelling God's kingdom as the true alternative. And if you want to know what that might look like, John 18 and 19 give you the model. Jesus confronting Pontius Pilate the kingdom of God against the kingdoms of the world, and arguing about kingdom and truth and power. Pilate, of course, ends the conversation by having Jesus killed, but actually God ends the conversation by raising Jesus from the dead, and we don't hear any more about Pilate after that. And with that resurrection, the sin of the world, the pride and the arrogance of empire is called to account. And by the Spirit, Jesus' followers now must be as so people. They must find appropriate ways of articulating that. Now this, of course, goes directly against the assumption of many Western Christians over the last few centuries who have reacted understandably to earlier religiously inspired wars and persecutions by creating a total separation between church and state. I'm told that some people have that written into their constitution. I can't quite believe that. But in your country or mine, actually, every time a church spokesman tries to, a spokesperson tries to address issues of public policy, somebody pops up and says, oh, please you stick to teaching people how to go to heaven or how to say their prayers, and, and we'll run the world. But the point of the gospel of Jesus is that God has come into our midst in and as Jesus himself. And the point of the promise of the Spirit is that God comes into our midst again and again through Jesus' followers. And part of the Spirit's promised work of leading the church into all truth, which people often quote, is not just about doctrinal development, but about speaking the truth into a world of lies speaking the truth of the cross 
into a world of violence, speaking the world of love into a world of arrogance. This is at the heart of the Johannine vision of the Church's mission. And in this word I sense a further hint of new creation itself. In Genesis 2, you know, there are two trees. The tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, in John 20, we have the promise of life at the end of the chapter. John declares that he's written the whole book so that in believing you may have life in Jesus' name. But here in verse 23, I wonder if we have a new creational version of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What humans were not allowed to taste before, just as in chapter 7, the spirit was not yet because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now they are given because good has triumphed over evil on the cross. And the followers of Jesus are to be given the prophetic insight to know and to name good and evil, to declare forgiveness to those who turn from their sin and the retaining of sin to those who persist in it. Of course, the church's announcements are not arbitrary. By the Spirit, they are to know the truth. The church's mission following and copying Jesus in his kingdom ministry is to include as one vital part the articulation of good and evil and the holding of the world to account by that standard. Now, I've said enough to indicate what I take to be the broad lines of a Johannine theology of the church's mission. I want to conclude by suggesting that the three highly personal scenes in John 20 and 21 are designed not least to provide working models of mission. First Mary, then Thomas, then Peter are portrayed vividly and memorably, and these portraits can provide not merely theoretical models, but practical worked examples. First Mary, John 20 verses 1 to 18. Mary is first with the news at both levels. She is the first one to discover that the tomb is empty and to tell other people about it. Then she is the first one to be commissioned by Jesus himself to announce to all the others that he is alive and that he is ascending to the Father, as Jesus memorably, put, memorably puts it, to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Up to that point in the Gospel, Jesus has always referred to either the Father, or my Father, or the Father who sent me. Now with Calvary and Easter behind us, all Jesus' followers call him a Father, call God Father, in the same way that Jesus did. But Mary doesn't come to this task easily. She comes through tears. It is through her tears that she looks into the tomb and sees the angels. It is through tears that she wrongly and rightly guesses that Jesus is the gardener. It is with her eyes still wet with tears that she hears Jesus address her by her real name in some of the key texts. You have the Aramaic form Miriam as opposed to the regular Greek form Maria. And Mary's tears resonate too with that memorable moment in chapter 11 where God incarnate weeps at the tomb of his friend. Jesus himself embodied the grief and anger of the Creator God at everything that destroys and distorts and defaces his good, good creation. And part of John's missionary theology is to say that this is what it looked like when the Word became flesh, that nobody has seen God but Jesus has revealed him, perhaps as much in his tears as anything else. Some silly theologians used to say, well, Jesus did A, B, and C because he was divine, but then he was hungry and wept and so on because he was human. No, Jesus' tears tell us more about divinity than we had dared to imagine. And now Mary Magdalene shares those tears. I've been working in church life on and off all my adult life. I've come to know a certain amount about tears and I know that again and again, when God's mission is going forwards, some of those who are commissioned to that work will only see the way forward through tears, the tears of disappointed dreams, the tears of loss or human grief, the tears of frustration when other people, even in church, seem to block or even destroy a kingdom project that's going ahead. 
But Mary is, of course, the archetype of a new world of gospel ministry. All gospel ministry and mission flows from the announcement that the crucified Jesus has been raised from the dead and that he is the Lord of the world. And Jesus chooses Mary to launch that mission. I've often said it, and you'll see where I'm going with this. Jesus doesn't say, well, now, Mary, I have an important announcement, but please will you go and get either Peter or John, because it must be somebody like that, i.e. a man, who makes this important announcement. No. Mary is the apostle to the apostles. She is the first missionary of the resurrection. And her scene, which opened in tears, ends with the first commissioning of an apostolic missionary. Mary to Thomas in verses 24 to 29. Thomas is known as Doubting Thomas, but the little vignette here indicates more than our word doubt. Thomas questions. He's not going to be taken in. He isn't going to be led away by fantasy or wish fulfillment. And just as Mary, perhaps to our surprise, is the first one to tell others that Jesus is alive and is Lord of the world, Thomas is the first one in John's Gospel to address Jesus's, Jesus as my Lord and my God. This is where we come full circle from chapter 1, where the Word is with God and the Word is God. That truth has been hinted at in a thousand ways, but Thomas is the first one to blurt it out directly. And I see in this something profound about the mission of the church. In all sorts of ways, as Jesus says, it is better to believe without seeing. After all, that's how everyone since the first generation has had to come to faith. But because Thomas insists on having his questions answered, he is able to say what nobody had said before. I see a great encouragement here in the church's task of apologetics. Not everyone has difficult questions, but some people do for all sorts of reasons. And it's not appropriate to wave them away and tell them they should just have faith. Sometimes, as with people like C.S. Lewis, it's those who have most clearly articulated their reasons for not believing, who, when things become clear, are able most clearly themselves to speak out the truth of faith. Thus, just as Jesus is seen by Mary through her tears, so that she can provide the message of comfort, comfort to his friends in the world, so Jesus is recognized by Thomas through and out the other side of his natural and appropriate questions, his doubts providing the extra reassurance for all who are puzzled or scandalized by the truth of Easter. Thomas is seen, which began with doubt, ended with the proclamation of Jesus as Lord and God. And finally, Peter, in chapter 21. Peter, of course, had let Jesus down badly. In chapter 18, in the high priest's hall, on a chilly spring night, Peter had gathered with others around the charcoal fire. And now, as he and his friends come ashore with their huge load of fish, there is a charcoal fire burning on the beach. Mary saw Jesus through her tears. Thomas recognized him through his doubts. Peter comes to Jesus through his failures. That's a really important point about John's theology of mission. Simon, son of John, says Jesus, do you love me? And here we miss the subtlety of the Greek because often we just translate Peter's response, yes, Lord, you know I love you. But it's a different word. And some of the wisest commentators that I've read will point out that the conversation goes like this. Do you love me with that agape love, with that self-giving? And Peter can't say yes to that. He's just let Jesus down badly. So he clings on to what he can say. Yes, Lord, you know, I'm your friend. It's a good word, but not at the same level. Jesus' response must then have taken Peter's breath away. Well, then, he says, feed my lambs. Peter may have expected a word of rebuke, and instead it's a word of commissioning. As with Mary's tears and Thomas's doubts, I sense here a powerful working model of mission and ministry. All Christian ministry grows out of undeserved forgiveness. When Jesus says, feed my lambs, that of course implies forgiveness. I'm now trusting you again. 
A few years ago, when I was working in the Church of England, there was a proposal to shorten the ordination service by omitting confession of sin and the giving of absolution. The service was going on far too long, so we can get rid of the bits that don't really matter, somebody said. My colleagues and I in Durham, I'm proud to say, rejected that right away because all Christian ministry and mission flows from our awareness of the forgiving love of God. Otherwise, mission might easily become arrogant, a matter of charging off in our own strength to do God's work in the world. The world has had quite enough of that. The Petrine commissioning incorporates forgiveness. But Jesus isn't yet finished. He asks the question a second time, gets the same answer. Now, Peter, look after my sheep. But then the third time, Jesus uses the word that Peter had used. Simon, son of John, are you my friend? John says that Peter was upset that on this third time Jesus said it like that. But I think what Jesus meant, which is of profound importance for the whole business of how people are called and equipped for mission and ministry, I think what Jesus is meaning is, well, Peter, if that's where you are, that's where we'll start. The mission of God to the world doesn't start with perfect, fully formed disciples. It starts with penitent disciples who know their own weakness, who remember their own failures only too well, but who are determinedly clinging on and saying, yes, Lord, you know I'm your friend. Peter's scene, which begins with the painful memory of failure, ends with the commission to be a healing under-shepherd to the master shepherd himself. Even then, the final scene in the chapter shows Peter wobbling just a bit, not unlike what happened when he walked on the water or what happened when he confessed that Jesus was the Messiah one minute and the next minute tried to persuade Jesus he was wrong about the cross. There are as many vocations within the ministry and mission of the church as there are disciples ready to follow Jesus. So when Peter looks at somebody else, perhaps the beloved disciple, and says, well, what about this person? That is simply missing the point. That's none of your business, says Jesus. Supposing I want him to remain till I come, not a problem for you. Your task is to follow me. So I think that John intends the tears of Mary, the doubts of Thomas, and the penitence and failures of Peter to be vivid examples and models of his theology of mission. God's mission to the world rooted in Israel's scriptures, focused on the word made flesh, is then focused by the Spirit on the word becoming flesh again and again, in and through Mary and Thomas and Peter and all who hear that word. As the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. Don't think about somebody else's vocations. Follow me in yours. May God give us grace to hear and in our own day and in our own callings to follow. Amen. Wow, how incredible is this? I hope you guys are enjoying this and I hope you're learning a lot. I want to ask you for a second to subscribe. Uh, if you're enjoying the content, share it, like, press that like button, slap it. Uh, help this channel grow. Help the message of the good news of what Jesus has done for this world. Get out. Uh, you're a part of this community with me. I always say we, uh, and really, it's just me behind the camera. But I've got you guys as support, encouragement, and you're here for the ride. And I'm so grateful for you. So thank you for subscribing. Thank you for liking. Thank you for sharing the content. And thank you for being a part of this journey with me. Let's get back to ringing them bells.